So as we begin our program, we thought it would be important to share some background to the discussion. According to the National Alliance on Mental Illness, depression is the leading cause of disability worldwide. In addition, people with serious mental illness have an increased risk for chronic disease, like diabetes or cancer. We also know that 19% of U.S. adults with mental illness also have a substance use disorder. So why share this background? Research shows that there is a ripple effect on mental health, on our family, our community, and our world. Today, COVID-19 has brought fear and anxiety to the forefront. With that, we will discuss some of those factors, the impact on our community, and hear questions from you. Our event format will begin with a national keynote address from Dr. David Sheehan, who will then pivot to become our moderator, who will engage our two panelists, Baha Zayden and Louise Wasilewski regarding questions relevant to our vulnerable populations, especially here in Georgia. So before we begin, I want to share congratulations to my committee. We couldn't have done this without all of the participation from these wonderful people. This committee serves on our TAG Digital Health Board of Directors. Each dedicates time outside their very busy business day and their business role to contribute. So let me recognize Brian Fowler from Truett Health, Anita Bellini from Anthem, Chris Watson from N90 Group, Fahid Salim from Azalea Health, Mary Beth Marconi from Whitley, Ellen Hess, an independent consultant, and Maurice Rosenbaum, our very own uh, host here for the webinar from NView Health. Next, I'd like to share a few words from our event sponsor. Again, we couldn't do these types of events without folks participating and contributing to these events uh, throughout the year. So I'd like to share with you Joseph Bakutis. He's the senior manager for Deloitte and he'll share a few words uh, from his firm. Yeah, sure, thanks Jody, I appreciate it. So good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Joe Bakutis, and I am the National Health Technology and Digital Health Technical Accounting Specialist for Deloitte and Touche. First off, I'd love to congratulate Jody and her team and the rest of the TAG Digital Health Board of Directors and Advisors on making this virtual session possible. Every day, I'm amazed at how agile our community is and how we can respond, recover, and thrive in challenging times such as these. In my role at Deloitte, I am responsible for the monitoring of health tech and digital health technology and the marketplace activity at a local level in Georgia and even at a national level, including the developing of the firm's response to the current COVID-19 crisis. I urge each of you to visit Deloitte.com where you will find important information regarding COVID-19, such as information regarding the CARES Act and how it impacts businesses and individuals from an income tax perspective information on how resilient businesses can confront the current COVID-19 crisis, and also other information on the pandemic and how it's impacting and affecting the life sciences, healthcare, and digital health marketplaces. Along with visiting Deloitte.com, I am happy to be the representative of the firm and discuss how the firm can assist individuals and businesses alike navigate these challenging times. I want to sincerely thank everyone for attending and if there are any questions on how Deloitte can help, please feel free to contact me directly. With that, I'll turn it back to Jody. Thanks, Jody. Great, thank you, Joe. We really appreciate your support. Now let's begin our program and allow me to share a background introduction of our keynote and moderator, Dr. David Sheehan. Dr. Sheehan was born and educated in Ireland. He completed his residency training in psychiatry at Massachusetts General Hospital and Harvard Medical School. He is the Distinguished University Health Professor at the University of South Florida College of Medicine. He was Professor of Psychiatry, Director of Psychiatry Research, and the Director of Depression and Anxiety Disorders Research Institute at the University of South Florida College of Medicine. Please welcome. Dr. David Sheehan. Thank you very much, Jody, for your kind introduction. 
I'm really honored uh, to be invited uh, to give you a little presentation today. I'm so impressed by the work that your society has done. It's uh, really uh, going to make a big impact. It's as if all the work that you have done up to this point has been preparing you for this moment that history has dropped into your lap, unfortunately. Uh, but it's a great opportunity for you to be able to make a difference and move things forward. So what are the lessons that history has learned from the 1918-1920 pandemic? Well, the great book written on this was by John Barry. Uh, you see it on your screen. He was interviewed a few days ago on CNN, and he was asked, can you tell us in a nutshell, what's the great lesson that history has learned uh, from this 18-20 uh, to 20 pandemic? And he said, oh, it's very simple. Tell the truth. It was that simple. He said, all the mistakes came back to that. All the benefits came from it. He said, if you can do that, people can be prepared and they can plan accordingly and make wise decisions. Here's a picture you see on the right of your screen of the famous biblical story of the Tower of Babel. And those of you familiar with that biblical story know that this um, civilization was feeling very full of itself, building this great edifice up into the heavens to glorify its accomplishment. A God looking at this was a little um, dismayed at their arrogance, so he tried to teach them a lesson. And how did he do that? He didn't drop an atomic bomb on them. What he did was he made it so they would speak in different tongues. In other words, uh, they would speak in different languages and they wouldn't be able to communicate properly with each other. And then the whole civilization fell apart. So here we are, you know, <laughs> 2000 years later, and the biblical story still has the same lesson to tell us, which is so much of this depends on accurate, truthful, um, and sophisticated communication to make our enterprise move forward. Now, some facts, the truth. This pandemic, like other pandemics before it, will approximately affect 40 to 80 percent of the world's population. That means it will affect uh, directly 3 billion people. These are not my data. These are data from World Health Organization. The um, connection is at the bottom of the screen. About so if we average that out and let's say 60% of the world's population will be affected, um, and as I say, that's about 3 billion people, half of those from the preliminary data we have will be asymptomatic and half will be symptomatic. So that means about 1 billion people will get mild, moderate, severe symptoms or um, pass away. Based on the current data, but this is a moving target, 3.4% of reported cases die which means probably about 50 million people uh, die worldwide from this pandemic. Best estimates, again, it's a moving target. That means approximately anywhere from um, one to three million people in the United States. Um, of the patients um, who get it, 15% uh, of the patients in intensive care units die, and of patients put on ventilators, 50% of them die. So people have been talking about, well, it's going to last a few weeks, then we'll all go back to work um, in a few weeks, and we'll all then live happily ever after with a rising economy. Unfortunately, that's not what history has told us about any of these pandemics, specifically about viral epidemics like this one. The reality is, even with flattening of the curves, when you flatten a curve, the volume under the curve doesn't actually decrease over the long run if you don't have a cure. So it's going to happen in multiple waves over one and a half years, and you'll only really feel comfortable um, going forward when you either know you've had it for sure and you've survived, and now you can go out and expose yourself because you've got immunity for the next two years, or you um, have an antibody test, which is not yet available but soon will be, uh, courtesy of Abbott, and then you're able to show that you have antibodies to this specific coronavirus or a vaccination becomes available. But to run that number worldwide to make this available or even in the United States, we're talking for most people, especially those um, over 50, 55, um, it's going to be another one and a half years. So in other words, the fall of 20, 
uh, 21 at the earliest. Now, that's the bad news. On the other side of the coin is, if everyone in digital health is making an investment into making tools and getting, um, um, make, doing something that will make a difference in all of this, the initial investment is worthwhile because it's not all going to pass in a few weeks. It's going to forever change um, how we live and how we uh, interact. And it's going to forever put telehealth on the map and it's never going to go back. Now, I mentioned that this is going to occur in multiple waves. And here's data just from the United Kingdom um, for the 1918-1919 flu. Now, what you can see here is that the first wave was a little small one in 1918, although there were, in fact, in fact, some cases in 1917 in the United States. Then everyone said, okay, we can come out of our homes. We're going to be fine. And then within a few months, it raced back up all over again to a second and even more dramatic uh, peak uh, that, of course, coincided with children going back to school and the fall uh, months and the colder weather. And then after that passed, it, and another dip and everyone felt safe coming out of their homes. And then we had another peak all over again. And by the way, this is not the end of it, because in fact, there were other peaks that rippled out from this even through 2020. Now, are there effective tools? Well, as it turns out, yes, there are. There are no treatments that are effective. There won't be um, a vaccination for at least uh, one and a half years. Uh, but personal protective equipment really makes an enormous difference. The dose that you get of the virus is a driver of your likelihood of surviving. So if somebody coughs or sneezes in your face and you don't have protective equipment, you're more likely to get a big dose that will overwhelm your immune system before you have a chance to build up antibodies. Ventilators make a big difference for those that have severe form and hospital beds. And you see people on the right side of your screen, those in China that had the uh, full on um, protective gear that you need in intensive care units and, in, and uh, coronary care units and um, emergency rooms to, prof to pr fully protect the staff uh, there. Um, below that, you see an anesthesiologist in an N95 mask that filters out large percentage of the viral droplets. And you notice that not only his eyes are covered, but also his hair is covered because this can also get into your hair. Now, you and I can certainly lobby for all of this, uh, but we can't directly do anything about it ourselves, at least not apparently. Um, but we certainly we can't emphasize enough the importance of all of this to protect the uh, first line um, people helping us. Because if we don't, as they tell us, this is like sending them like soldiers to the front lines in t-shirts and flip-flops without any ammunition. It doesn't matter how many guns you have at the front. If you don't protect the, the soldiers going up there and you don't have enough soldiers because they've all died off or in any way large numbers of them have died off or in, are incapacitated, then you've got nobody to fire the guns and then everybody is exposed. Anyway, what can we do? Well, social distancing, you've all heard, is critically important. And learning to properly allocate resources that we have available, including the top three. And I'll talk about those in more detail. So here we are in the 2020 pandemic. What can you and I do? Well, we can socially distance by going virtual. So digital healthcare, telehealth itself can be a form of personal protective equipment. Everybody can do that. Here are some pictures of my seven-year-old grandson um, who attends a science and technology school uh, for bright children in California. And here he is last week uh, with all his classmates uh, doing teleeducation and they're teaching them about the coronavirus and the pandemic. It was amazingly sophisticated. He walked me through it. I was very impressed. If we can do this with seven-year-olds, we can do it for everyone. Indeed, I learned a great deal from him about how to optimize some things in Zoom and in these telecommunications. 
there are several vulnerable groups in mental health we have to pay attention to. Obviously, the mentally ill, which is the focus of our discussion today. And particularly those who are homeless, the elderly, the incarcerated, healthcare providers and first responders, refugees, they're in every community, victims of violence, particularly domestic violence. There's been an uptick there. Teens, veterans, and increasingly going forward in the future, poor countries. Because if we don't help these poorer countries, once we um, go back out into the community, the infection will spread back to those of us who are not protected with antibodies and will reinfect us all over again. And once again, we teach everybody, even the young. So here is a future um, Surgeon General of the United States doing a public service announcement. She is three years old. Her mom is a Harvard trained and Hopkins trained, Johns Hopkins trained cardiologist who is a healthcare provider on the front lines in Baltimore. And her, she wants to protect her mom. She doesn't want to infect her mom. She doesn't want to be reinfected by her mom when she comes home from work. So they've had to teach her how to wash her hands and take cautions to keep everyone in the household protective. And let's hear what she has to say when she was asked, how can you defend against the coronavirus? Taboho, how do you prevent coronavirus? You have to wash your hands with soap and water to, and rub them between your fingers here and here again. Wonderful. Good job. So if we can teach three-year-olds to do it and to teach them, use them to teach other children. They can be our extenders in telehealth and telemedicine because we don't want this little girl to end up as an orphan and everyone in every household have to protect each other. Now, the vulnerable mentally ill groups um, are um, obviously uh, schizophrenia, bipolar disorder, major depressive disorder. A word about bipolar disorder. Uh, when patients are manic, uh, they become grandiose, expansive, and become often hyperactive, take a great deal of risks, expose themselves to infection, expose others to infection, and make a lot of decisions that reflect poor judgment. Similarly, patients with major depressive disorder, their immune systems are much more vulnerable than our immune systems. They are more prone to get infections, and when they get infections, they are more likely to die. So we have to make sure that they're getting all their meds correctly, they're getting the proper support and therapy that they need in order to minimize the impact on their systems. Anxiety disorders, PTSD, many of the first responders and healthcare professionals are going to get PTSD or already getting PTSD uh, from the trauma that they're exposed to. People with eating disorders, they're basically also um, getting uh, problems because they're not eating properly and they see this as an opportunity now to eat even less because of their uh, reduced access to food. Substance use disorders, uh, these people often are taking risks in order to get access to their opiates or amphetamines or methamphetamines, and they're exposing their families and each other uh, to getting more infections. Uh, patients who are suicidal often think, oh, this is a great opportunity. Now I will basically expose myself to the infection and then I will get it and die and no one will guess that in fact, what I was really doing is I was really trying to kill myself. Uh, we've all seen examples on video uh, over the last few days of people getting on subway systems um, and the videos taken by others. They take down their mask, they lick their, their hand, and then they wipe their hand down the bar that people hold on to in the subway stations. That is by exposing others, some of whom will die from the um, infection. Um, that is technically manslaughter. Uh, but this is happening, and it's been videoed by others in subway stations and trains and elsewhere. So again, we have to make sure that those people are properly evaluated and properly uh, treated. Dementias. 
uh, people with Alzheimer's disease, obviously they're especially vulnerable, we all know that. And several of these, but not all of these disorders, several of the disorders are associated with impaired judgment. So to the extent that we make sure that we're not just only treating infection and physical health, but also mental health, we minimize the risk not only to these vulnerable people, but we reduce the risk to everyone else to whom they are exposed. Now, there are a few digital tools I just wanted to uh, show you, draw your attention to. Uh, this one by Kinza Health, um, which is there are people who make digital thermometers. You see them here. I don't recommend the ones you put in your mouth, but certainly the ones you put in your ear, the digital thermometer. It has an app on your iPhone. And basically, that iPhone will tell you what your temperature is and will track the temperature over time. Over a million households in the United States have access uh, to that. And now they have mapped that across the United States. I'll show you that in a moment. We also have things called Oura Rings. You see that Oura Ring on your right. Um, OuraRing.com have partnered with University of California, San Francisco, given the first responders and all the physicians in the emergency rooms and intensive care units, the Oura Rings to wear at night. Uh, the Oura Rings detect the um, temperature of the first responders and healthcare providers, um, their heart rate variability, their breathing, and then gives them an email in the morning says, your temperature went up last night, your breathing rates faster, your heart rate variability, is out of line with the last week. Uh, you need to basically get tested before you pass your infection on to somebody else because you're going to be several days asymptomatic um, before you even know that there's anything wrong. And this way you protect the patients and not spreading it around the hospital. A wonderful application of digital health. I've also already ordered my Oura ring. Unicast.com basically has pulled together all the information from people's um, cell phones and made maps of the United States to show how this uh, social distancing is working, or shall we say, not working as well as it should. I'll show you examples of that. So looking at, for example, the Kinza thermometer application, as just one, this is just to toss out ideas um, to you. This is um, yesterday's uh, Kinza health map. And you see up here at the top right-hand corner, the colors uh, reflecting atypical illness, okay? And atypical illness is the temperatures of the people across the United States going up. That's beyond what you expect from the last eight years of temperatures going up at this time of the year in that region and is presumably reflecting the coronavirus infection. So when we look across the United States, what do we see? Well, we see New York, of course. We're hearing that on television. Chicago, yeah, Detroit. But look what's on fire. What's been on fire for the last week or two is Florida. And that hasn't gone away. And it's been on fire even before um, New York was. And there's almost no testing done in Florida. There's no stay at home ordinance in Florida. People are running around the beaches like there's nothing happening. What this does is it precedes by two to three weeks, the beginning of an upsurge in the hospital beds being full and three to six weeks after you see this picture, the system gets overwhelmed and there are no more beds in the intensive care unit and here's the example of this. So you see here the typical range in the blue band that is from the last eight years, and the trend was occurring up through the end of February. Then you see nationwide in the beginning of March, it started to go up, and that was only at the end of March when people panicked that they began to basically socially distance, and now their temperatures, even from the regular flu, are going down because they're not contaminating each other as much. Now, there is the picture of your region. This is Georgia, okay? There's Fulton County. There are the atypical cases. You see that just in the last two or three days, that started to light up in relation even to the rest of Georgia. Look what happens down here in your county. 9th of March, it started to overshoot with the atypical cases. March 23rd, it started to nosedive in absolute tandem with the stock market and is now only beginning to normalize a little. 
Here is another um, application from Unicast looking at social distancing. And what that does is it compares your community for social distancing with the activity that was prior to the COVID-19. It gives ratings to all the United States, which is a C by the way, in social distancing, not even an A. It shows all the different regions and how they compare with each other. Yeah, Chicago and Illinois doing better, New York doing better, obviously, and New Jersey doing better. Florida and Georgia not doing so well. And when we look down here at the change in mobility and on the same graph, the new reported cases, you see the orange line going along February, March, 0%, just as you'd expect uh, from the last six to 12 months for that time of the year. Then we move over and we see that as we um, decrease the social distancing, because people started to see cases emerging, it went down and down and down. In fact, it went down by 40%. And then as we got mixed messages from politicians, then what happened was people said, ah, it's really not as bad as we thought. Um, and now it's starting to worsen all over again. Because you see people said, oh, look at that. The curve is beginning to flatten. Everything is okay. We can all go out. And you know what's going to happen? If you look at these intervals, they're a week spaced apart. This is all going to flame up on fire all over again. So here's another application of the social distancing. It shows you the potential impact of ignoring social distancing. And this is a partnership between the Tectonic GEO and X Model Social. So I'm going to show you that quickly. Um, it's a little video clip uh, that basically shows that happening. We wanted to see the true footprint social gatherings like spring break beach crowds could really have on our society in the face of a global pandemic. To do so, we started with the big picture, powering our engine with billions of anonymized location data points from mobile devices across the globe. Using tectonics, we can then zoom in on specific regions. Here, we focus specifically on just one beach in Fort Lauderdale during the month of March. Again, each of these data points shown on the map corresponds to a unique mobile device active on a given day. You can see clearly that device activity spikes during the two week stretch of early to mid March, corresponding to spring break, no surprise. Now, using an analysis called a spider query, we can actually track movement of these devices over the remaining weeks of March, seeing where these devices went after spring breakers left the beach. As we zoom further and further out, it becomes clear just how massive the potential impact just one single beach gathering can have in spreading this virus across our nation. It can be hard for us to realize sometimes just how connected our world really is until the data tells the stories that we just can't see. So what can we do finally? Well, we can socially distance by going virtual. All of you are key players in all of this, so let's do it. We all can't be all things to all people, so we all have to focus on doing what we do best uh, and get teams of people around us who can help us in that endeavor. And you're all geared up to do that, so let's do it. And one of the things I would stress, because again, you're all geared up to make this possible for your state. Don't depend on federal government and others who are way behind the curve on all of this. You need to build resource platforms that make available um, information about logistics and supply chain for all kinds of health and mental health care. Where can we get this? Who needs what? How can we get it to them? And above all, like back in my first picture of the biblical story of the Tower of Babel, how can we get everybody to communicate with each other better virtually uh, so that we can all help each other get through this more successfully and save lives? Now, in the context of all of this, some of this is obviously alarming and distressing, but we must remain positive. We can't just sit there and mope. We've got to do something and we've got to make a difference. And we've got to reach out every day and try to do something for someone else who's less fortunate than all of us. And in the context of all of this, we mustn't lose our sense of humor. One of my colleagues sent me this uh, little email uh, that he saw the other day on the web. And it read, 
to psychiatric patients. Dear patients, during quarantine time, it's considered normal to talk to your walls, your plants, your pots and pans. Kindly contact us only if they reply. Your supportive healthcare provider, Dr. We Care. So that concludes my remarks. And now we're going to uh, have a poll. So let me hand this over to you, Maurice, so that you can um, have people do a poll. Great, uh, thank you, Dr. Sheehan. That was, really, that was really good. So we've just launched the poll. So about 65% uh, yes on the first question, about 60% no on the third, and about 80% <laughs> uh, agree that it will certainly make their condition worse. So thank you, Dr. Sheehan for uh, letting us uh, share, that, share that poll with you. So now let's uh, introduce our panelists, um, Louise Wazaleski and Baha Zaydan. And let me have them introduce uh, themselves and tell you uh, what they've been doing and what their plans are, and then I'll have some questions for them. Louise. Thank you, David. I'm CEO of a Civil Aid and we've built a platform pocket that's designed to connect um, case managers and case workers and their clients. We've been focused on the criminal justice space. So helping probationers or parolees manage being on probation and parole and working with their probation and parole officer, but also supporting them in getting the assistance that they need of which mental health and substance abuse are, are one of those key needs. And if you look at the US jail and prison population, somewhere between 45 and 65 percent of that particularly vulnerable population suffer from serious mental illness, substance abuse, or a dual diagnosis. And at this time, we're now also working with health and human services agencies to enable care providers who would normally go into a home. So think elder care, um, uh, child welfare, foster care, uh, to help those staff members who would normally go into a home stay in touch with the vulnerable people that they're serving um, today. Uh -huh. Well, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you, Dr. Sheehan, for the uh, earlier uh, presentation. Very informative. And thank you to the TAG Health Board um, and for putting this together and all the, uh, uh, the people who are involved in making this event happen. Uh, I'm Baha Zidane. I'm the CEO and co-founder of Azalea Health uh, Innovations. Azalea Health is a Georgia-based health IT company. Uh, Azalea has been focused in delivering a platform um, for physicians and, and patients to facilitate communication and for physicians to document uh, and bring them an electronic health record uh, platform that is simple on the cloud. And as of today, uh, according to Dr. Sheehan's um, presentation, Azalea is in the personal protective equipment. We deliver um, a telehealth platform for our patients and, uh, and providers. And um, we're honored that uh, this is the, a, has been a ripe time for leveraging technology to solve uh, uh, an issue like the uh, coronavirus. And we're very passionate about this because we see technology has a huge role in improving the healthcare and giving access to the underserved patients um, for give them access to better care, give them access to more providers. And uh, appreciate you, everyone, and look forward to um, the discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Bob. So let's start off with a question uh, for Louise. Louise, what um, are we seeing in Georgia that if we fix some of those primary obstacles, uh, Georgia could be an example for the rest of the United States? Thanks, David. I think there are two areas um, where Georgia has really made significant strides that could be shared with other parts of the country. A few years ago, the Atlanta area homelessness providers had to deal with an outbreak of treatment resistance tuberculosis. And as a result, those providers developed uh, a working protocol and have experience that could be shared with other communities around dealing with a, a highly in infectious um, and very serious illness. So in fact, uh, Atlanta and its experience through that treatment resistant tuberculosis outbreak could be very well positioned to share protocols 
for addressing uh, COVID-19 in the homeless population. One of the other activities that we're involved in here in Gwinnett County, they use our software to help individuals who are being released from jail to have continuity of care. Um, many individuals have their behavioral health issues stabilized while they're in the care of the justice system. But when they're released, they don't get to take the, um, a medical record or their summary with them. And so that means it's very difficult for a provider on the outside, a CSB, for example, to provide continuity of care. And uh, that's a problem that we've been able to help them solve with our software. If you're able to provide continuity of care through the gate, those individuals are much less likely to decompensate. And that will lead to less law enforcement involvement if they don't decompensate. So those are a couple of things that we're doing here um, in Georgia that could be good models for the rest of the country. Well, thank you, Louise. A question for Baha, and this Baha is in your area of expertise. What changes and incentives um, is the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services, CMS, uh, what are they providing um, in the way of services to combat COVID-19? Uh, great. Th uh, this is a great question, and it's uh, been a hot topic for our industry. Uh, but before I answer that, I just want to let you all know, know that I'm in a basement in, in Roswell, uh, Georgia, uh, not practicing, uh, uh, practicing social distancing. So not in a vineyard somewhere, um, as you can see the background picture. But to answer the question, uh, we've seen there's a huge, uh, going to be a huge shortage for access uh, to care in the coming weeks, months. So uh, the government, um, the insurance, and the payers have uh, done a lot of steps, made, made a lot of steps to make it easier uh, to access payments. Uh, they accelerated payments to providers and, and, and hospitals. We also have seen access to the bureaucracy in the healthcare has been removed. So one example of that, uh, a physician and a clinician can uh, practice across uh, border lines. Uh, typically, a Georgia provider cannot practice in Florida without a licensing uh, uh, procedure, going through a licensing process in Florida. And this sometimes can take upward of three to six months. Uh, we've removed all of those barriers to allow providers to, to um, uh, provide care uh, without thinking of where, which state we're seeing. Uh, as we saw, the governor of uh, New York uh, is asking for providers across the nation to come practice in New York. In normal circumstances, a provider in Kansas City cannot practice medicine in New York City uh, so without licensing. Uh, also, we're seeing um, a huge uh, uh, temporary expansion of coverage around telehealth. Um, we're seeing uh, 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 the government uh, uh, relaxing the rules around what, uh, how can we use telehealth? And this is gonna be a huge impact to patients. They're gonna enable patients to access their providers without going into the physician office. And an example of that, we're, we're all suffering, you know, they're gonna be a spike in, in um, issues related to behavior health, especially when people are, uh, uh, trapped in four walls for a long time and we the government has relaxed the reimbursement so now an encounter between a patient at home and a therapist or a psychiatrist or a behavior health provider uh, from their own home as a provider can be paid fully by uh, Medicare and other private insurance other things, we're uh, the government allowing uh, critical access hospitals to uh, be licensed for more beds than typically they are licensed for. So typically, a, a small rural hospital would be licensed to have 25 patients maximum. And now the government uh, relaxed those rules and allowed them to leverage uh, uh, any uh, any uh, facility within their their uh, within their community to have it, that facility slot licensed as a hospital. Whereas as an example, uh, if, if a hospital has a clinic or an office from just right out adjacent to that building, they can uh, use that clinic as part of the hospital and bill 
for those encounters as a, a hospital bill. And we're, we're seeing a lot of relaxation around the uh, uh, rigid rules in the healthcare, um, and that's going to provide uh, a huge access to, to, to providers and it's going to simplify uh, uh, the cure or simplify in helping those, those patients during this time. Thank you, Baha. Louise, I have another question for you. What are some of the Georgia-based resources for mental health and behavioral health services? Thanks, David. So in, in Georgia, mental health for vulnerable people is often provided by the community service boards. They're really the heart of the provision of behavioral health for vulnerable people. Um, something else we have available people may not know about is the Georgia Crisis and Access Line. Um, they have uh, the following 800 number, and I'm telling you this in advance, so anyone has the opportunity to write it down. It's one 800 715-4225 and that's a 24 by 7 helpline and it will speak both with people who are in crisis and with somebody who is worried about a person they know who's in crisis. Uh, in, in Georgia we've also invested in some of the metro areas in CITs, crisis intervention teams, and CITs are where law enforcement professionals, uh, police, have been trained in how to respond to mental health calls. Several counties in Georgia now have CIT teams. We also have counties that are planning to build crisis stabilization centers uh, where people in crisis can be taken to be stabilized as an alternative to being processed by the criminal justice system. So they don't get booked and they don't get arrested um, and have an arrest record. They don't spend a night in jail. And while these tools may be um, relatively unfamiliar to people. Miami-Dade found that less than 100 individuals, primarily homeless with schizophrenia, accounted for 2,200 arrests and collectively spent 27,000 days in Dade jail, had 13,000 emergency room visits, and we need to keep our emergency rooms open uh, for those with very serious illness now. Of course, those individuals were un uninsured, and so that cost uh, Miami-Dade, $13 million, cost their taxpayers. So how Miami responded was they put 4,500 officers from 36 different justice agencies through this crisis intervention training, and they saw some really astounding results. So in 2013, they handled over 10,000 mental health-related call-outs, but they made only nine arrests. As a result of this, their jail population was reduced from 7,800 to 4,400. They were able to close their main jail, and that resulted in an annual saving of $12 million. So it, it's not just that this is um, kicking the can down the road, um, but those individuals who are um, you know, engaged with law enforcement but go through a CIT path instead of getting booked, um, they're taken to a crisis stabilization center and 80% of those individuals agree to treatment and they get help with housing and recovery. And the recidivism rate of that serious mental illness population dropped just amazingly from 72% down to 20%. So these, these tools that are available, Community Service Board, the Crisis Access Line, CIT teams and crisis centers uh, can really have just a, a, a massive impact. Thank you, Louise. Um, I have a final question here for Baha, and I know you've got some fresh um, off the press uh, data on this. We don't have a slide on that, unfortunately, but perhaps you can walk us through it. What are the changes independent physicians are implementing to combat COVID-19? And your team has done some lovely work on this yesterday. Yes, uh, so uh, uh, thank, you. thank you again, Dr. Sheehan. Azalea Health uh, has uh, surveyed um, hundreds of our providers in the last uh, two weeks. And uh, one of uh, my colleagues, Fahad Salim, who leads our client services uh, team, and actually he's a TAG Health board member, he's, he, he was in charge of this effort. And we went out and just basically made calls to our providers across the country and asked them simple questions. One is, what, what are you doing? Uh, during this difficult time. 
and uh, what kind of help are you expecting to get and and from this conversations we got to uh, uh, we received a lot of insights from providers. Uh, one of the key insights that we saw that uh, there's a, uh, a big drop in, in, in seeing patients and it's been happening in the last couple of weeks. And uh, one of that uh, is, of course, um, physician offices uh, across the country, they are uh, small businesses, so they're going to be an impact on their business. However, when we start looking at what areas there are, they are prioritizing, we saw that communication and telehealth uh, is a huge priority for providers across uh, the country. So we're seeing a huge adoption of telehealth. We're seeing about 30% of providers implementing telehealth today. And also they're looking at all sorts of communication tools like mass texting, um, uh, uh, patient portals communicating uh, using different means of communication with their patients and those are some of the key things that they're right now investing in but one of the other area that we noticed is the workflow changes um, uh, the, the coronavirus had made uh, physician offices to think very seriously on how they get treating their patients so we're seeing some patients are uh, some providers changing their um, workflow where they're only seeing well patients in the morning and seeing uh, sick patients in the afternoon. We're seeing some that they're actually uh, triaging their patients in their cars in the parking lot and leveraging some uh, uh, communication tools using the mobile app to engage with that patient while they're in the, in the parking lot and, and and lower the risk of that patient coming into the in the door without triaging them in the car in the car first. Mm -hmm. uh, we've seen even um, uh, physicians uh, uh, taking extreme measures where uh, they have an area for suspect coronavirus patients where uh, is separate from the will visit areas of their offices. So uh, physicians, just like any business, they're thinking differently now, and especially with during this uh, difficult times, and mainly communication tools and telehealth is their top priority. Thank you, Baha. I know you've been receiving um, questions from the audience, um, Maurice. Um, so would you like to tell us, ask some of the questions uh, to the panelists? I'd uh, be glad to. Uh, we've gotten two, uh, two really good questions that have come in. Um, the first kind of dovetails on your comments, Baha, about telemedicine. But with the increase in telemedicine and telebehavioral health, can these be used just as effectively after uh, this crisis is over as we're about to use them now? Absolutely. Um, you know, the, the, the Medicare and the government guideline has been clear to say this is a temporary relaxation of those rules. But we all know once we use technology, we fall in love with it, you can't take it back from us. Uh, you know, right now we're, we're seeing the benefit of virtual meetings. Guess what? After after uh, Corona is settled, we're going to continue to use virtual meetings uh, at a much more um, uh, uh, frequency than before uh, before uh, COVID um, uh, nineteen. Uh, but we're, we're going to see a lot of adoption in those in, in, in technology, and we're seeing just in general technology enabling um, uh, uh, providers access, lowering cost, improving quality, uh, and with telehealth and other tools, not only telehealth, like I will mention some of the uh, uh, telepsychiatry tools, which is using telehealth to engage with your uh, psychiatrist or a behavior health provider, or tools like AI uh, that will enable us to find patients with certain diagnoses uh, where a provider couldn't you know, didn't do the assessment themselves. Let computers do those assessments. And so we're going to see um, adoption to for, for technology tools like this continue moving forward. Great. Thank you. Um, one final question that's come in here um, with this, and maybe this is a good one for you, Louise. With social distancing, you know, working out of the home and being sequestered uh, is causing stress. What are some of the ways people can relieve stress by themselves and what's available to them, you know, certainly outside the home? And I guess this goes to any of the 
any of our panelists or, or speakers. So, I mean, it, there are many ways in which we can uh, relieve our stress and each of us have our own favorites. Um, but I think just reaching out to somebody else that you think may be alone is a very good way to help, right? If you can help relieve their stress, it gives you that sense of doing something to help. Um, that also gives you the benefit of, of that contact connection. Um, you put the uh, crisis helpline number in the webinar chat. So I'd just like to draw attention to that to, to people too. Um, we are still being advised that exercise is good. Um, you know, sit on your deck in the sunshine, right? Exercise and sunshine are two of the best tools to help with depression. And I see uh, Dr. Um, Sheehan's head nodding there. And they are things that are still available to us. Even if you are not a great exercise or before this could be a really good time to do that that's great thank you so much dr sheehan i turn it back over to you to wrap us up terrific well listen this has been very informative we all learn from each other we listen to each other there's no one solution mm -hmm. fits all there are many solutions and we need to reach out uh, so let me pass it over at this point uh, to chris carabinas who's going to tell us about future uh, things that you're going to do and about the sponsors. Thank you, Dr. Sheehan, Jody, um, Maurice, and the panelists. Uh, that was a wonderful discussion and I appreciate it. I'm picking up a lot of new facts there. Um, two things that we're gonna cover here towards the end of the program. One, I wanna share some information about upcoming events um, that you're gonna to wanna to be aware of. And two, I'd like to share um, three of our society sponsors, you heard from Deloitte at the top of the program, our event sponsor. But we have three society sponsors that we're very proud of and are very appreciative of their help in helping us put these uh, events on. The first one I'd like to ask to speak is Italian Services. Uh, Bill Brady is the sales manager for Bill. And Bill, if you could take a moment and share with the audience uh, what you guys do. Sure. Thank you, Chris. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Bill Brady, and I'm the client manager with Tellion Systems, a uh, product engineering and custom software development services here uh, based in Alpharetta. And we're probably celebrating our 10th anniversary this year. Uh, we partner with small and large technology and software product companies in healthcare, financial services, and several other verticals, and have expertise in a broad range of technologies, building mobile, cloud, or embedded software solutions from concept all the way to implementation and we can provide ongoing support and maintenance. I'd certainly be open for a conversation. If you have any questions, feel free to reach out to me at bill.brady at talient.net. Thank you, back to you, Chris. Excellent, thank you, Bill, I appreciate that very much. Uh, I next I'd like to ask Fahad Saleem, Vice President of Client Services with Azalea Health, who Baha mentioned a moment ago, uh, to tell us a little bit more about Azalea Health. Thanks, Chris. Um, good afternoon, everybody. Um, as Chris said, I'm the Vice President of Client Services at Azalea Health. Baha mentioned a lot about what Azalea does, who we are. Basically, we are an enterprise EHR platform that provides healthcare business solutions to individual physician practices, as well as hospitals. Um, so that includes electronic medical records, uh, medical billing, practice management system, patient engagement software. Um, and during these times, one of the biggest things that we are working with our clients on and offering for them is our telehealth module. And um, as of about a few weeks ago, when the COVID-19 uh, pandemic sort of started to surge, um, we as a company made a decision to offer telehealth for free to our entire existing customer base. And that's, you know, hundreds and thousands of providers. Um, so, you know, th th that's a decision that we've made as a company and we're continuing to be dynamic with as things are changing with COVID-19 and the pandemic and are shifting our focus accordingly. Um, so therefore, if there, are, if there are any needs or if there are folks that you know, like to connect afterwards with Azalea Health, myself or Baja, uh, feel free to reach out to us. Um, back to you, Chris. Thank you, Bahad. That is incredibly gracious for you guys to provide that platform free. Uh, that's, sure. that's amazing and thank you for that. Uh, next, I'd like to ask Dr. Shwata Sneha, Executive Director of the Healthcare Management and Informatics Program at Kennesaw State to say a few words. Thank you, Chris. Um, as the Executive Director of Healthcare Management and Informatics at Kennesaw State University, my job entails enabling, impacting, and leading the development of a robust workforce with skills at the intersecting domain of healthcare technology, 
analytics, computing, management, and leadership. We are very fortunate to have a very to have a strong support from our board of advisors. Uh, many of you serve on our board, including Chris, uh, Baha, Jody, Michelle. We appreciate the collaboration and partnership in research, mentorship, and internship with our board members. And uh, our students have been working on several projects with them. That includes, and some of our uh, board members are represent organizations such as Wellstar, Pigon, Pack Mutual, Anthem, Sharecare, and our students have. Uh, have contributed in various leadership and innovative roles uh, across the continuum of healthcare organizations across Georgia. If any of you would like to explore opportunities for research partnerships with us, please do reach out to me at sneha at kennesaw.edu or via LinkedIn. Thanks again. And back to you, Chris. Thank you, Dr. Sneha. If we could advance to the next page. I'm going to show you two slides here. The first one are upcoming events for the TAG Digital House uh, calendar this year. The January 30th event has passed, so has today's event. We have two more virtual lunches coming up in April and May. You can see the topics there. Um, appreciate you guys participating in this format and hope you'll participate in that format too. Uh, the other events on the calendar, we have some really different programming for us. And I hope we get a chance to do, conduct them live. That's what we're planning, but we'll also always have a virtual component on all of our programs going forward. One event I'd like to, uh, it's a dual event, I'd like to point out in particular, on July 30th and October 28th, we have a two-part event that we're partnering with Georgia Hymns and ATV Atlanta Tech Village on. And it's a reverse pitch where we're asking Navison Atrium Health out of Macon, South Georgia, to come in and they're gonna have CEOs of two different uh, healthcare uh, uh, hospitals that they have in South Georgia come up and share issues and pain points that they are looking for people to propose them on and their unique challenges and we're inviting people to basically come in and pitch their solution to them so it's a two-part event look for more information on that in August we're also partnering with TAG Corporate Development that at Society around digital health investments in a COVID-19 world we think that'll be very interesting and then in September, we're having our digital health think tank with Justin Barnes. Many of you guys may know him as he was on our board for a while and a very important with Greenway and, uh, and hymns on a national level. So he's coming in to lead a really interesting think tank uh, session there. And of course, we have our summit at the end of the year. Uh, at this point, we're thinking it's going to be virtual, depending on how uh, <clears throat> the, uh, the virus uh, goes. We'd love to do a, a live one, but we just don't know that yet. And the last page is a couple of other society, uh, a, a, other events outside of TAG that we'd like to make you aware of because we like to support each other in this healthcare technology ecosystem. But Georgia Hymns, they have a webinar on Thursday of this week around hospital revenue cycle management concerning uh, related to COVID-19. And then two weeks later, they have one around, that's the telehealth COVID-19. But So they have two different, one around uh, hospital revenue cycle and telehealth. And then ATV has a, an event in May currently scheduled to be a live event, but that may go virtual too. And there's others, and I apologize if we forgot others, but really appreciate everybody participating. I know we're about a minute over, but appreciate the great program Jody and Dr. Sheehan and Maurice have done, and appreciate your participation, and uh, uh, hope to see you at the next event. Goodbye, thank you very much. Mm -hmm.